Um, good morning, and uh, thank you for coming uh, to see my presentation this morning. I, I know you had other viable options. Um, and thank you to those of you who voted to include my presentation in this agenda. It is indeed an honour to have been included. Um, my presentation today is called Too Agile or Not Too Agile, An Iterative Dilemma. Uh, and although I see some familiar faces in the room, I should probably start by introducing myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Rajanda. I'm currently the Senior Manager of Business Analysis at the RAC, um, where I manage a team of business analysts who work on projects across the organisation. Um, you lost me? No, now I'm back. Um, I'm also, uh, as was said, the um, Perth branch chair of the International Institute of Business uh, Analysis uh, Australia chapter. Uh, my background is in computer science and statistics and I've worked in and around IT for over 20 years, including some time as a developer and in roles such as uh, data, uh, data analyst, uh, solution architect, project manager, but I always find myself returning to project-based business analysis roles as I find this is a position that you get to do a lot of different things and it has quite a bit of variety. But my passion is very much about solving problems, something that I'm sure I share with many of you here today. Now, before I get too deep into my presentation, I just want to give a shout out to Triple D Perth sponsors as events like these would not be possible without their sponsorship. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the community partners, She Codes, Level Her Up and Breast Cancer Partners as they do fantastic work. Uh, so for the presentation, uh, now there should be plenty of time at the end uh, for questions. So if any questions come to mind, please keep them there and ask them at the end. So this presentation stems from an issue I have grappled with over a number of years. I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the terms waterfall and agile uh, and probably works for an organisation or a team or on an initiative that manages change using an approach that falls into one of these categories. When it comes to technology projects in particular, how you manage a project is often presented as a binary choice. It's either everything waterfall or everything agile. The two types of approach are often presented as being in competition or conflict with each other. However, I believe this binary view of management is increasingly being challenged, with initiatives often involving the delivery of both digital products that are associated with more agile methods of delivery and more physical deliverables traditionally managed through waterfall approaches. By the way, just as an aside, I'll be using the terms project and initiative interchangeably during this presentation, but everything I'm about to say can be equally applied to any body of work that facilitates change, whether it's a project, program, work package or product. So what I'd like to do in this session is discuss some of the issues with combining waterfall and agile approaches, as well as some things to consider when selecting or combining approaches so that initiatives can be set up from the outset to deliver holistic solutions as efficiently as possible. But first, I'd like to provide a bit of background as to how this presentation has come about. So as was said earlier, I've been working in and around IT for around 20 years. And in that time, I've been involved in many projects of differing sizes that have used different delivery approaches, including variations of SDLC, uh, and other waterfall software development models and project management methodologies such as Print2, as well as different flavours of Agile from way back when we had RAD or Rapid Application Design through to things like Kanban and Scrum and even some more scaled Agile models. Some of the projects were very successful, some went okay and there were a complete few complete disasters. But it was a more recent project that really got me thinking about how waterfall and agile delivery approaches are applied to initiatives. So I was, in fort so I was fortunate enough to be involved in a project called Project Symphony. Project Symphony is a partly federally funded pilot project that is still in the final stages 
It is the first true pilot project I've ever worked on. The project was one of several projects across Australia that were, uh, that were funded to test a set of theoretical models that had been proposed for managing electricity generation on the di from distributed energy resources, or DER, on the electricity network. So DER is a term that includes things like solar energy systems, household batteries, and controllable loads, such as water heaters and pool pumps, and also EVs, although these were excluded from this particular pilot. So to put it more simply, the project was essentially testing methods for managing increasing energy generation by households, particularly from solar systems. The aim for Project Symphony was to aggregate these distributed energy resources together to create a virtual power plant. The idea was that if you coordinate all the DER so that you maximise energy use and storage when energy generation from solar was high, but energy use by household was low, such as during the weekdays, and minimise use and discharge batteries at times when energy use was high, but generation from household DER was low, such as in the early evenings. The project involved three main delivery partners. Synergy was responsible for creating and managing the virtual power plant by recruiting customers and their DER to be part of the virtual power plant. That also involved installing, uh, installing household DER that could be controlled. The Australian, market operator, Australian energy market operator, or AMO, was responsible for creating a simulated marketplace that the virtual power plant could bid into similar to how big generators bid in now. And Western Power, which was the team I was, I was uh, associated with, who was responsible for monitoring the network to ensure the virtual power plant was operating safely. It, they were also responsible for installing a larger battery system that could be used as part of the virtual power plant. Each organisation ran its part of the project using an agile methodology. The teams would all come together to discuss, discuss problems define interfaces and coordinate delivery. Then go back to their individual teams to refine requirements and manage delivery. As a pilot project, Agile was the best methodology to use as we were literally identifying problems, reworking solutions and generally making things up as we went along. This worked for the most part. However, as part of the project, Western Power was to install a one megawatt battery on the network and set it up so that Synergy could control it along with the other household DER as part of the virtual power plant. The installation of the battery itself was going to follow quite a defined waterfall process. It needed to be procured, concrete slab needed to be put down, it needed to be installed, connected to the network, a fence put up, etc, etc, etc. These things were fairly predictable, the dependencies between them were clear, and we had good information as to how long they would take. However, it was the first time a battery of this size was going to be installed in a residential area of Perth. We also needed council approval. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with local government, but it's fair to say councils are not known for their speed or agility. This, this is particularly true when you're doing something new or for the first time. It is fair to say the council concerned was they were largely supportive of the project, but they knew they were setting a precedent. They had a light to, quite a lot to consider. One megawatt batteries come with quite large and noisy fans. There is a small but potential fire risk. And the battery was going to sit on an oval adjacent to a high school, so general safety was also a concern. As the project was working using an agile method, we broke down all the waterfall tasks uh, required to get council approval for the battery into user stories, and dutifully assign them to sprints. We also broke down all the tasks to required to install the battery, as well as all the IT tasks required to integrate the battery into the virtual power plant, and put them on the backlog so they were ready for when we got our council approval. But inevitably, there were delays. We managed to reorganise some of the work so that we could deliver some of the IT elements without the battery being installed. But it eventually got to a point where the tasks that were left were heavily dependent on battery installation. Now, the project managed to work around the problem and reorganise how the virtual power plant would be tested to accommodate the delays. The project is in its final stages 
and looks like it is going to deliver some excellent learnings on how to manage DER using a virtual power plant. And it has even been nominated for some industry awards. So in summary, Project Symphony included a combination of problems that required collaboration and exploration to discover new and innovative solutions, defined processes for physical deliverables, such as the implementation of the one megawatt battery, and fairly ambiguous processes, such as the one to obtain council approval. The experience got me thinking about how we manage these sorts of initiatives that require a degree of agility, but are also beholden to prescriptive waterfall processes. It prompted me to write an article on the subject which was recently published on B in BA Digest, which, if you're not familiar with it, is a great grassroots publication on everything business analysis. And the process of writing the article has led me to conclude this. There are some who suggest that waterfall and agile kind of sit on a spectrum, like coloured paints that can be mixed and create new combinations. However, the reality is, Waterfall and Agile are more like water and oil. No matter how much you mix, there is always going to be some separation. So let's consider this methodological divide by first understanding when we should select one approach over another. In cases where you have a clearly defined scope that is unlikely to change, your requirements are largely known or easily discoverable, the solution and deliverables are known, and dependencies are clear. Agile, there is no point using Agile. Agile, with its rituals, involves a management overhead. The rituals are great for discovering refi and refining scope, requirements, and solution in cases where there is some ambiguity. But if these are known, there is no point investing in that overhead. It is not necessary. You may as well use a more waterfall approach. But in cases where you do not have a clearly defined scope, the next question you should be asking is whether or not the initiative is required to follow or is dependent on prescriptive waterfall processes. These may include things like governance or approvals processes, such as the council approval project that Project Symphony was required to follow. Or it could be uh, processes to create one or more deliverables, such as the installation of the one megawatt battery. Or in some cases, some initiatives may be impacted by business processes, such as annual reporting cycles. If the initiative is not impacted by these sorts of prescriptive processes, this is when they, they knock yourself out. Go agile. There is nothing stopping you from managing everything using an agile method. However, if there is a dependency on a prescriptive waterfall process and the scope is not clearly defined, this is when you should consider mixing and matching agile and waterfall approaches. But let's first start by considering waterfall. First thing I want to say about waterfall management approaches is waterfall is not inherently bad. There are some people in IT who view waterfall as bad and they probably have very good reasons for forming this view. However, when applied to the right initiative, waterfall may be the most efficient route to delivery. Also, there is some scope for creativity in waterfall. There is a lot waterfall can learn from agile principles. For example, waterfall delivery can make use of agile techniques such as retrospectives to keep a team connected rather than working in delivery silos. Or you could use things like showcases to keep stakeholders informed and engaged throughout the initiative rather than engaging at the end when you're ready to implement. Now on to agile. Agile is great when there is a clear vision and everything is within the control of the Agile team. And by that I mean they have access to the information they need or it can be easily obtained 
and they have some authority to make decisions. Agile is also great when the scope is flexible and the requirements or the solution are not known up front. That is why Agile is great for things like the pilot project, the pilot project like Symphony, and for continuous enhancement of digital products. However, it is important to realise that Agile is not inherently good. When applied to the wrong project, Agile can be an inefficient method for delivery. A lot of time can be wasted in stand-ups and planning meetings, reorganising and reprioritising backlogs, or completing lower value work just for the sake of keeping busy. Of course, this is all at, completely at odds with Agile principles. And one key cause of this can be waterfall processes. Dependencies on waterfall processes can be a barrier to Agile delivery. So just to recap, waterfall is great when there is a defined scope that has to be delivered. Agile when the scope is less clear and more flexible. Waterfall approaches are good whenever uh, waterfall approaches are good for managing internal and external dependencies associated with prescriptive waterfall processes, while agile works best when everything is within control of the agile team. And waterfall is often great for the delivery of one-off physical things, while agile is great for supporting continuous learning and improvement. Now let's move on to the subject, subject of mixing and matching approaches. We have already talked a bit about how mixing waterfall and agile can lead to inefficient agile planning, particularly where waterfall dependencies introduce delays. This can also mean a team is unable to focus on high value work. Another risk we haven't talked about yet is agile metrics. Such as spin, agile metrics such as sprint velocity and burn down are great for monitoring team performance. However, when agile tasks are impacted by waterfall dependencies, they can mess with the metrics, making them less meaningful. Mixing waterfall and agile can also lead to highly fragmented initiatives. This is where an initiative is decomposed to a ridiculous level uh, and in the case of mixing waterfall and agile, this can happen when you are trying to remove waterfall dependencies so that an agile team has the control to deliver. Something that is comically depicted in this geek and poke cartoon. It just makes the overall management of the initiative more costly. So what can we do to mix and match agile and waterfall in a way that works and allows us to manage and identify risks? Well, there isn't an easy answer, and there certainly is not a one-size-fits-all approach. But a good first step is to identify any prescriptive processes that may impact agile delivery, such as approvals processes, products that benefit from a wall, more waterfall delivery, and time-specific or event-driven business processes. Next step is to understand those processes as much as possible. Is the process clearly defined? Does it have an SLA associated with it? And can you trust that SLA? Will the process result in the creation of a standardised deliverable? Next step is to understand the agile dependency. Which epic or backlog task does it relate to? What are the options for mitigating risk? Or is it simply something that we have to accept? And what are the risks when the process does not deliver when we need it? Once you understand your prescriptive processes and their impact, you can start to think about the best way of structuring your initiative to enable efficient delivery. For example, maybe something like an agile sandwich, where a burst of agile activity is sandwiched between waterfall processes. You could see this approach working, perhaps, for an initiative that requires some sort of approval to get started, but also approval to get fully implemented, something I've seen a few times in health for systems that will be used to facilitate patient care. 
perhaps your initiative will follow more of a scrum fall approach, where agile activity is preceded by waterfall processes. Variations on this approach is co are commonly used in consultancy settings, where requirements are gathered in a more systematic way, but the solutioning is more agile. I had someone once describe to me an approach for procuring agile software de development services that followed this sort of approach. Where there was a master contract in place, but that separate statement of work was created for each sprint. The process to agree the high level outcomes and develop the associated statement of work was quite prescriptive, while the actual agile delivery of the solution was agile. Or perhaps it'll be more of a drip feed, where waterfall dependencies are closely aligned to agile sprints. You could see this approach working for initiatives which have particular governance or approval gateways, or where a physical deliverable is being produced and integrated alongside a digital product. These are just a few examples of how initiatives can mix and match waterfall approaches. However, every initiative is different so the possibilities are endless. It is really about understanding the business context and organising your initiative as efficiently as possible to suit the situation. So why does this matter, I hear you ask? Well, for a number of reasons. First reason, and the reason close to every business analyst's heart, is requirements management. Understanding when and how approaches will be used and how they are dependent on each other allows for better requirements definition, allocation and traceability to support the delivery of a holistic solution. It also allows for better planning and sequencing, particularly with respect to procurement and allocation of resources. And it allows you to respect agile principles as much as possible. You really only get the full benefit of agile approaches when you respect the agile principles. Now, many of you are probably aware of the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto. However, in business analysis, we, talk to we tend to talk about the seven principles of agile business analysis. See the whole, the principle that guides an analyst to understand the need in the context of the big picture, focusing on business context and why the change is necessary. Think as a customer, the principle that guides business analysts in ensuring solutions incorporate the voice of the customer and that there is a clear understanding of the expected user experience. Analyse to determine what is valuable which requires the continuous assessment and prioritisation of work to be done in order to maximise value. Get real using examples. Building a shared understanding of the need and how the solution will satisfy that need. Understand what is doable, understanding how to deliver the solution within the given constraints, including constraints in introduced by prescriptive waterfall processes. Stimulate collaboration and continuous improvement, the principle that guides analysts to create and contribute to an environment where all stakeholders contribute value on an ongoing basis. And finally, avoid waste. Identify which activities add value and avoid those activities which do not directly contribute to the goal. It is only when you take the time to consider how best to organise your initiative that you can get the full benefit of the delivery approaches that you use. May Waterfall and Agile never be in conflict again. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I welcome any questions. Does anybody have any questions? We're all shy. We've got one up the back there or one there. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you could give us a, uh, an example of something that might work. And maybe um, one example of a, um, uh, an absolutely stellar you know, mix of one of those models of waterfall and agile and a, and a massive buck up. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So Project Symphony, we eventually made it work, but it probably would have been more efficient if we thought about the council approval a bit more from the outset, because it's really those undefined or um, all those processes about SLAs that are a big problem uh, with Agile. Um, but ultimately, we, we worked around it. And I think that was everybody talking to, together and working out what we could do, uh, what, what, particularly from the IT side, what we could do without the battery install, how we could set up sort of like your um, uh, tests, um, uh, stubs and all that sort of stuff in order to facilitate all that. Um, uh, in terms of ones that I've seen that haven't done it very well, certainly um, I, was very, I was very put off by Agile initially. The first couple of projects um, I worked on with Agile were done really, really badly. And it was very much about not understanding the business context and understanding, and this was in the health system in the UK, but, uh, but the people who came in really didn't understand how that system worked um, and really didn't understand sort of like the pressures and the rhythm of the hospitals that we were trying to um, we were trying to do an integrated system that was getting data from all those hospitals. Um, they didn't understand how those worked, and that was a complete, complete disaster. Um, whereas I think if perhaps, because they just sort of came in and said, right, we're doing Agile, boom, and it was all Agile, whereas actually if you'd done that sort of discovery piece uh, initially, that was a bit more prescriptive, and then set up the project from the outset, um, it probably would have done a bit better. Uh, but that certainly put me off Agile for a long time. It wasn't until much later in my career that I saw a couple of really good examples of Agile working um, uh, that I sort of started to get on board with Agile. But it's a, it's a grain of salt. You've got to kind of step back and look at what you're trying, trying to achieve. And th these sort of initiatives now that are coming on where it is, um, that combination of, of physical and digital and... Um, there's that stakeholder stuff and there's those business processes that, that may be getting in the way and all that. It's about stepping back and actually thinking about holistically, well, what is it we're trying to achieve with each of the elements? Which bits do we know, the scope and how, uh, how they're going to be delivered and which bits are a bit fuzzy and setting it up as best you can. My question is, uh, with summer coming up, how did you go with the virtual power plant? <laughs> Um, so I, I was on the project from the initial um, when they set it up, um, but I did actually talk to um, uh, the guy, one of the guys at Plan IT, who was actually involved in the testing of it. He, they, they just finished the um, testing of it in August. They were testing a, quite a few series of things. So one was more about sort of um, controlling how much energy was coming into the grid and all that, but there was also a couple of situations that they were testing. So if there was too much electricity generation from solar, how quickly could you shut the virtual power plant down, what they call constraint to zero? And also if there was a massive fluctuation of energy, um, how quickly could you discharge a battery? Um, so that, uh, that, that they were testing a few different scenarios. And it sounds like they've had a few wins, a few things where they still need to tweak. A um, few questions about how it works in the market because you've got this thing at the moment where everybody's starting to talk about it's going to cost more initially to get all this, uh, all this renewable energy integrated into the market and how will that play out with the um, existing coal-fired power stations but also with all the big wind farms and everything that's coming on, how do we get that system working um, uh, properly, because um, you're basically moving from a situation where you've got a few big generators like coal fire, power, fire, coal fire power plants to a whole bunch of medium-sized generators. Some work with wind, some work with solar, some work with something, and then goodness knows how many smaller virtual power plants trying to control what's happening at the distribution end of the grid. So yeah, some interesting learnings. Um, it sure will get published. Uh, Project Symphony, a lot of stuff is online about that because it was federally funded by ARENA if you're interested. Thank, I've got the microphone, so I'll go next. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your presentation. I really um, love the pragmatic view of, compa of comparing the different, sorry, combining the different approaches. Um, I think like everyone in the room, there's an emotional reaction to both the words agile and waterfall, yeah. and it's really fraught. What is the role of terminology in combining different approaches going forward? Oh, look, there's, and, and that's the thing, you talk about waterfall and agile, and then behind that there's a whole spectrum of, of different methodologies and, and lots of organisations sort of have their own flavour and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I know that um, uh, particularly 
um, uh, and this is probably particularly true for, for developers and agile teams that sort of being able to work in that team setting and having that control and everything is quite important. And so when you've got these dependent processes and stuff that can sort of, um, uh, sort of affecting their groove and their cadence, um, that can be quite frustrating for them. Um, so for me, it's, and you said the word, it's pragmatic. It's, it is about being pragmatic and actually having that control. Whether or not you use the term waterfall um, is a bit, bit irrelevant. It, 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 as a manager, and uh, whether, whether you're a project manager or a general manager or looking at uh, a BA or a, a strategy analyst looking at the strategy, when you're coming into those initiatives, uh, it's about understanding how different parts of your organisation and your business and your suppliers and everything work best, and almost like shielding them from that. So if the Agile team's quite happy um, working on their product enhancements and all that sort of stuff, don't just start throwing a whole bunch of stuff on the backlog that's going to get um, stuck in, um, uh, in quagmire because it's dependent on a whole bunch of stuff. Manage it a bit better. Actually sort of think about when you start introducing that work into the backlog so that they do still maintain that control and do as much as possible. Um, so you might, not, you might not tell them that you're managing this waterfall process over here before you start planting stuff on their back, but you, might, you know, that's essentially what you're doing. Um, so yeah, it's that pragmatic approach, sort of understanding all the facets of the, of, of the, of the um, whatever the initiative is, uh, whether it's a, something BAU or a project or something like that, and just managing when it hits everything so everybody can work best. I think it's my turn. <laughs> So Where are we? here, here. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Anna. Oh, hi, Ting. Hi. Um, my question is, who actually make a decision whether or not you know we're going to do waterfall, we're going to do a agile? Is a BA, is a project manager, or is a stakeholder who pay? So there's the real world, and then there's how the world should probably be. Um, so a lot of people are kind of kind of beholden to one particular approach or another. Um, from my perspective, um, I have the opportunity at the moment to sort of shape a lot of the, the projects that are coming up in my organisation because I've got control of the business case process. So for me, it's from actually, from the outset, thinking about what is the vision that we're trying to achieve here? How much of the organisation is going to be involved? Has it got an IT component? Is it a business component? Has it got a more physical deliverable? Have we got a supplier involved? And actually thinking, start thinking about that early. So at the business case stage, you're actually starting to plant those seeds and those conversations and get that, that vision of how it's all going to go as early as possible. Of course, that's often not how things happen. Um, uh, I have the opportunity to drive that a little bit in my current role, um, but you always get the left field ones where somebody's already decided a solution and it's already ended up on somebody's backlog and, it's, uh, and, it's all got, and then it all goes a bit, bit, um, bit funny. In those situations, it's about actually then taking stock and actually getting everybody to stand back and to think, all right, so this is the situation we're in. We're in a bit of a quagmire because we've got all this work, uh, this uh, product space, digital work. It's held up by this process here or these two pr uh, product teams aren't work doing the same cadence and it's all got a bit haywire. So it's about, it's about understanding that and taking that step back and trying to reorganise things to, to drive that delivery as best as possible. Um, sorry. Uh, thank you, Anna, no. for your speech. Really helpful. Um, my question was about, is there a secret for, um, you know, estimations of time? Um, should we just not communicate uh, when the project will be delivered? Because it just always seems to miss the mark. So I um, personally, uh, there's a great tool in the business analyst toolkit called the straw man. I tend to put a, what I think is a realistic timeline together and then consult as widely as possible and see how many people go, Arr! you know, when you actually show it to them and, and get them to be realistic, actually get them to, to talk through what, what might happen, what are the risks and all that sort of stuff. And this is where, when you talk about waterfall, uh, we use waterfall when we have to deliver a defined scope. You know, time and that is largely irrelevant. People, people always talk about time because time is often associated with money. But at the end of the day, you, if there's, you, can't half, you can't half implement a one megawatt battery, for example. It's either all or nothing, you know, and it takes as much time as it's going to take. Um, uh, so, so when it's pure waterfall, then that, that 
element should be irrelevant. It's when you've got those dependencies on those more um, uh, agile uh, initiatives and making sure that you line things up so that they're working as efficiently as they can. It's like I said, unless, unless they are able to do true agile, it's not going to um, be as meaningful uh, for them. You won't get the best out of the agile part of the initiative. Um, my question is, um, in Project Symphony or any other project that has um, successfully mm -hmm. combined these um, processes, is there any conflict between the tools used to manage those? Oh, like yeah, I mean, and, you know, I, I, when you talk about um, whether or not you go sort of full, sort of, you know, everything on a sort of tool like Jira or um, DevOps or something like that, or whether you use the old Microsoft project, or I still know project managers that get out the Excel spreadsheet, even though it's just like tearing your hair out. Um, uh, at, at the end of the day, as long as somebody's managing that, it doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of making sure that, particularly if you've got established teams, that they are using what they are familiar with as much as possible, because you, you're already introducing change. You, they're, they're already trying to manage a whole bunch of change that they're inflicting on the rest of the organisation. You don't want to kind of inflict change on them at the same time. So as somebody who sort of does sort of more the management aspect, I try and maintain as that as possible. That, and that means that at the end of the day, the, the project manager or the um, BAs end up taking the hit and, and we sort of have to change how we work in order to facilitate the be most efficient delivery because at the end of the day, that's what it should be about. It's about delivering what is needed as efficiently as possible. <laughs> so I was wondering, where do you find the biggest inefficiencies when using these processes? And in a perfect world, how do we address them? The biggest inefficiencies, um, <laughs> I've worked in government a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Any process in government, you can get those inefficiencies. And it, and it is really, and this is the thing, um, a lot of, particularly in government, but in other organisations as well, that want that certainty, that, that waterfall sort of vision kind of provides that. So having, um, uh, so in inevitably, where I've had success in, in government, particularly in health, there's been a waterfall overlay over any agile initiative in order to um, create those gateways and those approvals and stuff so that um, the, the managers feel comfortable with that, particularly when you're talking about patient-facing systems because that's a bit sensitive and there's all the things that you need to do and sort of get um, uh, safety and approval um, from clinical people. Um, so there's always that waterfall process overlay, um, but that's very much about understanding the context you're in, uh, and other organisations may be different. Uh, it's all about the, understanding the risk appetite of your organisation. If, if, they're, if they're happy to sort of go down a rabbit hole and do everything agile from end to end and, and off you go, then great, um, but government in particular. Um, and that's where we were hit with the battery, because the council was like, yeah, sounds great, but it's a bloody great big thing that we're not familiar with being stuck in our area, uh, what do we do? So you really had to, f had to provide that certainty um, to them uh, before we could get on to the fun agile stuff. Following on from that, um, if you were gonna run a startup and try and build out a, uh, a product or a service, how would you implement um, a hybridized waterfall and agile approach? So, um, I've got, we very much depend on the business context. Uh, I mean, startups, I think, are a perfect example of where agile is brilliant. Um, again, there may be certain industries where perhaps having that waterfall overlay, um, particularly if you're talking about health and, and all that sort of stuff, um, may be more appropriate. You may still want to be able to do your problem solving and solutioning and that on the IT at that end. Um, the other thing is, is when you talk about startups, is those startups that are like purely digital product uh, build it and they will come type models, but there are those that you're sort of introducing with a uh, with a, a, a big business process element on top of it. So you're asking people 
to change how their organisation operates to a certain extent or alternatively you're going into the organisations and working out how you can adjust and change your application. I think that's where you start to have to think about what you're doing and maybe think about which elements that you sort of manage more, more in a waterfall and kind of outside maybe your more core agile team deliver, uh, technical delivery um, but really, really dependent on the business context. We've got time for one more question. No? Well, in that case, just um, some final thoughts. Um, if you have a good follow-up question, come and find me or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. There is only one Anna Rajanda at the moment. Um, so you should be able to find me. Um, want to find out more about business analysis, there's some information around IIBA, um, uh, both international and Australia. Um, we actually have our Festival of Business Analysis coming up as well. Go check that out if you're interested. We want to learn about Project Symphony or there's a whole bunch of stuff on the ARENA website around that. Um, they're about to do some of their final reports, so look out for them because they should be quite interesting as well. Otherwise, thank you.